Tonight on Bread Theory, we are going to be starting a new book. We have finished up the, the few essays that we uh, had looked at last time from David Graeber. And so that him being an anarchist, we're going to switch back to the communist side of leftism. And tonight we're going to do a book that I've been wanting to do for a long time that I, I, I just haven't yet. <laughs> Hello to you, Perennial Green, as well. Uh, so anyway, we're going to be doing a book that I've been wanting to do a long time that I, I just hadn't gotten to yet. A book that uh, when I when I talk to people that, that consider themselves communists uh, tends to come up more often than not as a book that inspired them perhaps more than anything. I often get that as, as a response when I talk to them. So that book is State and Revolution by Vladimir Lenin. Uh, the one of the leaders of the communist revolution in Russia uh, during just about 100 years ago, a little bit more than 100 years ago. And he was writing this uh, up until that point. He, in fact, stopped writing this book in order to go participate in the revolution. So uh, working on theory became less important than, than actually putting it into practice when he saw that the, the moment was right uh, to form what eventually became the, the Soviet Union. So... Uh, I, and as, as a departure from what I usually do, because what I usually do is listen to the audiobook version and then pause it from time to time, I thought I'd try something different. So I actually have, as you can see, the, the hard copy of the book, State and Revolution, and I'm just going to read it myself. That way we can perhaps manage the pace a little bit better. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that things will perhaps sink in a little bit more if if I'm not switching back and forth between uh, my, my own voice and the voice of the recording. So that's, the, that's my thought tonight. Um, and if you're new to the channel, if you're new here, I do this, this theory stream every Friday night at around 7 p.m. We got a little bit late start tonight because I was uh, uh, helping out. I was uh, a guest on a, another uh, stream, that being um, For We Are Many, Go check them out as well. I, I will leave a link to them as well in the in the show notes for this one too. Uh, they are a great uh, collective of leftists who who also do theory stuff. So we were talking about Emma Goldman and her anarchism and other essays. We were going through the first uh, little bit of the preface of it, and we'll continue along that series. Not sure when the regular day is going to be. We're gonna we're, we still have to iron out those details. But anyway, so I was doing that before, and that kind of ran a little bit long because we were having such a good time talking about that, that uh, I managed to, I only managed to start this just a, a few minutes ago. Uh, but anyway, I do this every Friday night. I, I stream a leftist book, or I, I try to do a chapter a week of a leftist book, and uh, it happens 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. And then also I stream on Sunday nights, uh, and you can check that out. As well, I, I usually go about uh, 7 p.m., although I've been trying to work it a little bit earlier uh, in the past weeks. And we'll be continuing on with our series on uh, getting introduced to the ideas of permaculture. So the principles and ethics and all the different practices and the ways that, that permaculture can be applied, uh, especially to leftist theories. And I'm going to have a, a special guest on this Sunday, Mike Hogue, who is a, a permaculture designer and practitioner who I've met through the Permaculture Facebook group um, and who I've been in, an admirer of his work for, for quite some time. So Mike Hogue will be on and we're going to go through a bunch of the different uh, permaculture practices that, that are, are common. Things like um, the, the ditch and berm or the, the swale and berm uh, on contour use of, of earthworks and, uh, you know, things like an herb spiral or uh, the... the um, the idea of companion plantings, uh, as well as, as tree guilds and stuff like that. So plants that, that do well together and support each other. All that sort of thing we're going to be covering this Sunday, uh, probably around 7 p.m. Uh, so, so look for that as well. So I think tonight we're just going to get straight into the book. I think I will do the preface as well as the, the first chapter. Uh, let's just take a look at the, the table of contents a little bit to see how long each of those are, because I actually have, I've not read a single word of this book yet. So, 
it looks like uh, the book itself doesn't start till page 18. So I think probably 18 pages of preface is probably a little bit more than, than I want to do tonight. If, if you feel like it's something that's, that's missing. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, I see. The, the, the book does start on, on page three. So yeah, three pages of preface and then up to page 12. Since this is, you know, my first time reading out loud, we'll, we'll see how many pages we get into. But the, the idea is going to be to get through the, the first chapter at least. So it looks like these chapters aren't all that long. So I think we'll probably be okay. We may even do a couple chapters. We'll, we'll see how, we'll just, I think we're just going to kind of see how far we get. All right, let's start with the preface of State and Revolution. The question of the state is now acquiring particular importance both in theory and in practical politics. The imperialist war has immensely accelerated and intensified the process of transformation of monopoly capitalism into state monopoly capitalism. The monstrous oppression of the working people by the state, which is merging more and more with the all-powerful capitalist associations, is becoming increasingly monstrous. Okay, that's not a particularly well-written sentence, but we'll continue on. The advanced countries, uh, we mean the, the, their hinterland, are becoming military convict prisons for the workers. Okay? The unprecedented horrors and miseries of the protracted war uh, and making the people's positions unbearable and increasing their anger, this world proletarian revolution is clearly maturing. The question of its uh, relation to st state is acquiring practical importance. The elements of opportunism that accumulated over the decades of comparatively peaceful developments have given rise to the trend of social chauvinism, which dominated the official socialist parties throughout the world. This trend, socialism in words and chauvinism in deeds, uh, Pleknov, Postrov, and Breshnikovskaya, uh, Ru Rubanovich, and, in slightly veiled form, uh, Sereteli, Chernov, and company in Russia, uh, Skiderman, um, one second, Leiden, David, and others in Germany, Runewaldo, uh, Gust, and Van der Velde in France, and Belgium, Hindemann, and the Fabians in England, etc., etc., is conspicuous for the base, servile adaptation of the leaders of socialism to the interests not only of their national bourgeois, but of their state. For the majority of the so-called <clears throat> great powers have long been exploited and enslaved, exploiting and enslaving a whole number of small and weak nations. And their imperialist war is a war for division and redivision of this kind of booty. The struggle to free the working people from the influence of the bourgeoisie in general and of the imperialist bourgeoisie in particular is impossible without the struggle against opportunist uh, prejudices concerning the state. First of all, we examine the theory of Marx and Engels of the state and dwell in particular detail on those aspects of this theory which ignore or have been distorted by the opportunists. Then we deal specifically with the uh, one who is chiefly responsible for the distortions. Karl Katowski, or Karl Katsky, excuse me, the best known leader of the Second International, 1889 through 1914, which has met with such miserable bankruptcy in the present war. Lastly, we sum up the uh, main results of the exper uh, experience of the Russian revolutions of 1905 and particularly of 1917. Apparently the latter is now, early August 1917, completing the first stage of development, but this revolution as a whole can only be understood as a link in the chain of socialist proletarian revolution being caused by the imperialist war. The question of revolution, of relation to socialist proletarian revolution, 
to the state, therefore, is acquiring not only particular political importance, but also the significance of most urgent problems of the day. The problem of explaining the to the masses, which they will have to do before long, uh, to free themselves from capitalist tyranny. Uh, Vladimir Lenin. So, chapter one, class society and the state, page the state, a product of, of the irreconcilability of class antagonism. What is now happening to Marx's theory has, in the course of history, happened repeatedly to the theories of revolutionary thinkers and leaders of oppressed classes fighting for emancipation. During the lifetime of great revolutionaries, the oppressing classes constantly hounded them, receive, uh, received their theories with the most savage malice, and the, the most furious hatred, and the most un, unscrupulous campaigns of lies and slander. After their death, attempts are made to convert them into harmless icons, to canonize them, so to say, and to hallow their names to a certain extent for the consolation of oppressed classes and with the object of dumping the latter, while at the same time robbing the revolutionary theory of its substance, blunting the revolutionary edge and vulgarizing it. Today, the bourgeoisie and its opportunists with the labor movement occur in, the, in this doctoring of Marxism. They omit, obscure, or distort the revolutionary side of this theory, its revolutionary soul. They push to foreground and extol what is, what is or seems acceptable to the bourgeoisie, all the social chauvinists are now Marxists. Don't laugh. And more and more frequently, German bourgeois scholars, only yesterday specialists in the annihilation of Marxism, are speaking of the national German Marx, who they claim educated the labor unions, uh, which are so splendidly organized for the purpose of waging predatory war. Okay, so what we have so far is, is Lenin laying out how he sees other socialist revolutions have gone. And he's talking specifically about the labor movements. And I, and I think he would, he would put uh, the, the Labor Party of England or, or the UK at, at the heart of that, where they, they tried to institute, their, their, their goal was to institute socialism through uh, democratic means by, by basically voting it into power and then remaking the state once once it had become the law of the land. And he's, he's kind of uh, laughing at them for calling themselves even Marxists at this point because he's, he's basically saying that they are failing in doing that. So, he continues, In these circumstances, the view of the unprecedentedly widespread distortion of Marxism, our prime task is to reestablish what Marx really taught on the subject of the state. This will necessitate a number of long quotations from the works of Marx and Engels themselves. Of course, long quotations will render the text cumbersome and not help at all to make it popular reading, but we cannot possibly dispense with them. All, or any, at any rate, all the most essential passages in the works of Marx and Engels on the subject of the state must by all means be quoted as fully as uh, possible so that the reader may form an independent opinion of the totality of the views of the founders of scientific socialism and of the evolution of those views and so that their distortion by the Kautskyism now prevailing may be documentarily proved and clearly demonstrated. Let us begin with the most popular of Engels' works, The Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State, sixth edition of which was published in Stuttgart as far back as 1894. We have to translate the quotations from German originals as the Russian translations, while very numerous, are for the most part either incomplete or very unsatisfactory. Summing up the historical analysis, Engels says, the state is, therefore, by no means a power forced on society from without, just as little as is it the reality of the ethical ideal. 
idea, the image and reality of reason as Hegel maintains. Rather, it is the product of society at a certain stage of development. It is the ad admission that the society has become entangled in the insoluble contradictions with itself, that it has split into irreconcilable antagonisms, which it is uh, powerless to dispel. But in order that the, these antagonisms, these classes with conflicting economic interests, might not consume themselves and society in fruitless struggle, it became necessary to have a power seemingly standing above society that would allevi uh, alleviate the conflict and keep it within the bounds of order. And this power, arisen out of society, but, but placing itself above it and alienating itself more and more from it, is the state. And that is from page 177 to 78 of the sixth edition of, of Engels's book that he was talking about. So what he's saying is, is the state is not something that comes from without. What that means is that the state is not something that's just imposed. It's not as though there's this, this separate class of people and they make up the state and they just make all the rules for everyone else. The idea rather is that the state should come from within the people, you know, a, a government for the people, by the people, you know, of the people, um, that sort of a thing that, that it, it, it comes about through the, the, the necessary conditions of, uh, or the necessary, because of the necessities of, of uh, you know, ordering things, putting things into order. Right. So it, it, it is set above the, the, the rest of the people only as much so is that it can then arbitrate how things happen within that state. Um, but it's not supposed to be separate completely. It's still supposed to be made up of the people. So I think that's what he's, he's trying to lay out in that passage there. Uh, this expresses with perfect clarity the basic idea of Marxism with regards to the historical role and the meaning of the state. The state is a product and a manifestation of the irreconcilability of class antagonisms. So because you have an owning class, um, the, the people that literally own the businesses and the workers that, that make that, that business run, that, that are the only reason that it's profitable, you have different vested interests from each of these classes. The workers are trying to get as much uh, money and compensation for their work as possible. And the owner, conversely, is trying to squeeze as much labor out of the workers for as low a cost as possible. His idea is only to make profit, right, in the capitalist system. So he has no interest in, in providing more for his workers than he absolutely has to. Um, so what Engels is saying, and, and what Lenin is saying through Engels, is that that's where the state has to step in and say, because of these, these uh, class antagonisms, we have to come in and, uh, you know, set things right, basically. So the state arises where, when, and insofar class antagonism objectively cannot be reconciled. And conversely, the existence of the state proves that the class antagonisms are irreconcilable. Okay, so then, then the, the idea that we have to have laws to restrain business people from just completely exploiting their workers is, is proof that we need to have the state, because otherwise they would. And I would say historically that that absolutely is the truth, especially looking at the historical context, context that, that uh, the world is coming out of at that point, the, the age of the robber barons of the, the late 1800s. Um, yeah, that, that was a pretty good example of what you have or what you get when you have pretty unfettered capitalism. Uh, things tend towards monopoly because there's nothing stopping the, the uh, one company from getting an edge and then just sucking up all the, the uh, business or, or just buying out or, or merging with other companies and just eventually becoming the, the, the largest, um, basically the only, you know, player with any, any uh, power in the game. So you have monopolies. You have huge exploitation of, of workers um, without 
any sort of child labor laws. You have children that, that literally work themselves to death, uh, especially in, in the more dangerous jobs like, like coal mines and stuff. It was definitely not uncommon for children to lose, you know, fingers, uh, limbs, their entire life just, just from uh, having bad interactions with the machines. The idea that there's no safety standards with any machines because that takes extra money. If, if your only goal is profit, then of course you're going to cut every corner that you can in order to make that profit. And, you know, from the businessman's perspective, that, that seems like a legitimate thing. Because if they don't cut that corner, if they don't take advantage of, of every possible advantage they can find, if they don't exploit every advantage that they can find, then one of their competitors might. And that might give them the edge to put them out of business. And that certainly is going to, uh, by not exploiting all those advantages, that, that's certainly going to put a big dent in their own profits. And profit comes above everything in the capitalist mind, in the capitalist owner's mind. So from their point of view, yeah, everything else be damned. Uh, environmental regulations, uh, safety laws, safety regulations, child labor laws, all these things, they don't matter as long as you can make a profit, basically. 10-hour, 12-hour, 16-hour workdays were not uncommon during that, that era as well. Uh, and the only thing that really stopped that was eventually the people demanding that the government do something about it and then regulation coming in. Uh, don't be fooled by the people that, that, say, that say that, oh, you know, regulation was inevitable. Um, you, you know, it, was, it, it all coincided at the same time that these movements happened. And, but it was, it was led by the business people, not by the, the, the people. That's just, that's, that's a load of bollocks. That's, that's not true at all. When you're, again, when, you're, when your only goal is profit, everything else comes secondary. So the state has to step in in order to right that ethical dilemma. Um, so yeah, that, that's basically what he is arguing here. And I'd say he has a lot of basis for arguing that unfettered capitalism is, is a hellscape for everyone but the owners. Um, all these these minarchists or right-wing libertarians, uh, so-called anarcho-capitalists, they, they all want this same sort of society where owners have basically unlimited freedom and it's at the expense of, of every worker. They may not admit that, you know, they may not even be aware of that, but that's that's what unfettered capitalism always has to lead to. It just has to. If you're in a, a more powerful position and you're negotiating with someone who's who's in a very much weaker position, you know, nine times out of nine, basically you're gonna win. And and they're just gonna have to accept whatever you offer them or starve, basically. That that's always the cudgel they can use against you when there's no state stepping in to like provide food or housing or any other basics of, of life they basically can can hold your life hostage unless you work for them or an equally tyrannical boss at another company or owner i should say so let's continue on though it is on this most important and fundamental point that the distortions of marxism proceeding along two main lines begins on the one hand the bourgeoisie and particularly the petty bourgeoisie, these are the, the small-time business owners, not the captains of industry. This would not be the Jeff Bezos or the, the um, Elon Musk class of owners. This is more like your, your corner shop, corner shop owner, um, some sort of local business person. That's the petty bourgeoisie. They, they, they're definitely still owners, but they don't have nearly as much power as these giant magnates. Uh, and captains of industry, um, or or business, or whatever it is that you're, we're talking about here. On the one hand, the bourgeoisie, and particularly the petty bourgeoisie, ideologists, compelled under the weight of indisputable historical facts to admit that the state only exists where there are class antagonisms and a class struggle, correct Marx in such a way as to make it appear that the state is an organ of the reconciliation of classes. Okay, so these, these would be basically like your progressive liberals of today. 
uh, they, they would say things like, we need the state to undo the worst damages of, of capitalism. But at the same time, let's, let's, let's hold off on regulating uh, capital as much as we possibly can under the, the false assumption of, of <clears throat> it being for the best for everyone. You know, these, these cliches like, uh, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. And, uh, you know, if we do things to unfetter uh, the so-called job creators, then it will trickle down. Uh, these are all tied together in, in, in neoliberal thought. Um, and so you have the, the, the very most progressive wing of that saying things like, you know, the state exists to provide where business is failing, basically. So business can't provide housing for its workers uh, on, the, on the salaries or the, or the wages that it's, it's tossing out. Then the state steps in and gives you subsidized housing. State or the, the business can't provide wages for enough food or enough nutritious food. The state steps in and provides that for the people. Uh, these sorts of things. So it, it is, is very much a progressive, liberal um, edge of, of the neoliberal uh, worldview that, that he's talking about right here. According to Marx, the state could neither have arisen or maintained itself had it been possible to reconcile classes. Uh, yeah, basically, why would you need to reconcile classes if they did it on their own, right? If, if it just got to the point where, yeah, like that, that phrase, the rising tide lifts all boats. If, if that were literally true, in the sense that, that everyone was raising up at the, at the same time due to all this wealth flowing in, you would have no need for the state. Uh, it is only because it doesn't raise all boats. In fact, it, even if it does raise all boats in uh, absolute terms, like they all start out or they all get to a, a, a part or a place where they uh, are better than they were before, in relative terms, the, the ones on, on top go even further. And, and you know, you get the, uh, the divisions of, of classes happening more and more. So I have a, a question in the chat here. The Sun King one says, are you a Marxist Leninist? I am not. I am, I consider myself an anarchist. I, I am suspect of concentrations of power. I think that it, it leaves too much room for um, bad actors to swoop into a, a power vacuum that may have been created or over time create enough power to do damage. And that even if the intentions of one strong leader are good, that because they're never going to be the last leader, because someone is eventually going to take their place, it opens up the possibility for uh, people with bad intentions to to come into that that uh, position of power and do not so great things. Um, so for those reasons, I believe more in, in a spreading out of power. Um, I believe in being suspect of any sort of concentration of power. That it that it it always runs the risk of of corrupting the the people that that are at the reins of power i'm not against marxist leninism i'm not against communism at all um one of the reasons that i do i do this uh this side of theory rather than just do anarchist books is to gain just a, another perspective in leftist thought i think when it comes down to it at, at the bottom of, of both communism and anarchy uh it's both going towards the same ideas of a more democratic, egalitarian, empowering society where people can live, you know, their highest and best lives and are not fettered by powerful people holding them down. How can anarchism work if the West will use its powers to undermine your society? That, that is the problem with anarchy. Um, as Kropotkin conceived of it, he, he said that the way that you guard against people coming in from outside or from revolutions from within um, or counter revolutions from within destroying an anarchist revolution, the way that you do that is you invest the revolution in the revolutionaries. You make sure that, that, the, that your first order of business after a revolution is to provide all the basics of life for as many people as you can. And that once people have been empowered and, and, have 
give, been given a taste of, of freedom and democracy that they will just of natural course resist any sort of movement uh, that goes against that. So that was his idea. I think that's definitely a possibility. Um, uh, yeah, I think just the idea of, of building up uh, parallel government structures with, within capitalism is another route that you could go where you see that the, you know, like, we'll take my, my, uh, my home, or my, my, not my hometown, but the town that I'm in right now, St. Paul, Minnesota, there's a lot of homeless people. And we see these, these homeless camps, uh, arising time and time again. And the government's reaction is basically just to shut them down, to, to tear them out. They may say things like, oh, we're going to put them in homeless shelters, but is that really that much better? Probably not. Um, homeless shelters are not great places that are going to give people the dignity and the, the, the solid foundation to, to live a better life, really. The only thing that will do that is, is actual housing. So in that is an opportunity to, to form a parallel organization so, and that would say, if the government's not going to give people housing that need it, we can. Uh, yes, but how can you achieve this giving to people when, let's say, your country isn't as developed? That's, that's absolutely a good question. There's a lot of ways that you can go about it. And I think this is one area where it's, it's, uh, there's a real um, opportunity for concepts such as permaculture to come in and help with that sort of thing. Because permaculture is all about helping people become more self-reliant, not necessarily self-sufficient, not necessarily isolated, uh, but more locally self-reliant. So building up systems of, of food and um, not just food, but, uh, you know, building supplies, um, you know, the fiber. It, it's usually conceived of as the, the five Fs, food, fodder, which is food for animals, fiber, which is um, building materials like wood or could be hemp, could be any number of things, um, uh, food, fodder, fiber, um, fuel, so that, that's, that's, you know, wood for heat usually, and then pharmacy. So with those five things, you can, you can definitely start forming a better basis and enough people coming together to do permaculture collectively can, uh, so who will do the, all the organizing, if not the Vanguard Party? Well, I'll just finish that thought. So people coming together collectively, they can really build a lot of power if they, if they work together, um, setting up all these systems to, to help one another. So that, that's one way that that can happen. So who will do the organizing, if not a Vanguard Party? It can just be local, you know, local neighbors getting together, deciding that they, they don't want to accept this or that condition. Maybe they're tired of living under a landlord and they want to get together to collectively buy the building they live in or, or buy another building that they can all go live in um, and form it into a cooperative. Um, it can just come out naturally. I think the best way to promote that sort of thing is to get more theory out into the world so that people have these ideas to, to arm themselves with and have a path forward to actually start these sort of um, alternative organization strategies. But the, the Vanguard Party definitely is a way that, that things could go. Uh, I'm, again, I'm, I'm not going to say that I'm ever opposed to communism. That, that's, that's another fine way to do it. Someone needs to initiate it. Well, it doesn't have to be just one person necessarily. It could just be something small. You know, in, in permaculture, we talk about. Uh, so, yeah. So who will do the organizing? Uh, sure. It could become it could be just one person getting together with their neighbors, giving them some of the, the anarchist literature or the communist literature. It doesn't really necessarily matter. And in fact, I think a diversity of tactics is, is needed in order to to push any real sort of movement. I don't think we should ever limit ourselves to just one course of action. Um, you know, Marx talked about geography being destiny, and, and that was to say that the material conditions that you're born into and the, the culture that you grow up around and that gets infused into you affects the way you see the world. So that being said, uh, people in different places are going to have different 
solutions that are going to be better or worse for what they need to, to get to or what they're trying to get to. So I think a diversity of tactics is important. We've got to try a lot of things all at once. Um, and the, the important part more than anything is that we're pushing leftward. We should be trying to, to push um, liberals that are, that are open to this, that, that just haven't quite given up on capitalism yet, don't want to, um, or maybe just haven't thought about capitalism that much, and really uh, come to the conclusion that it's a necessarily exploitative form of uh, economic organization. So we should be trying to bring those people in. We should be trying to just, in general, move people left as much as possible, I think. So yeah, there's nothing wrong with the Vanguard uh, party forming and, and doing that sort of thing. I think that's a, a very strong way that, that things can go. Um, of course, my worry is always that those people in that party are going to uh, be corrupted by power at some point. Um, that That's always my my concern with that um but but i don't i'm not against it at all i think that's that's totally fine so anyway i think we can uh, move on in the text here so we, we were talking about how the the basically the progressive liberals just want to um put a band-aid on things want to, to undo the damage of capitalism but think that we can still keep it at the end of the day and how that's that's wrong that we wouldn't need government if capitalism was ever going to right itself and that uh, the purpose of government is not to just bind up the wounds that capitalism inflicts uh, it's to instead uplift everybody really from what the petty bourgeoisie and the, the philistine professors and publicists say with quite frequent and benevolent references to marx it appears that the state does not reconcile classes i'd say that's pretty true uh, okay, another question here. So let me get my thumb right where the, I left off there. Are you of the opinion that social democrats are social fascists? Hmm. Uh, they perhaps enable fascism to some extent. Uh, they, they, they want to strike some sort of bargain to maintain capitalism. Um, and perhaps they... In, you know, in the, in the name of something like free speech, will uh, defend the, the rights of, of fascists to uh, inflict damage by the, the speech and recruitment tactics that they did. Stalin said that. Okay, so, yeah, you know, I'm going to admit my ignorance here. I haven't read up on, on Stalin pretty much at all. So uh, anything that Stalin says is not going to be something that, that I yet know about. Um, so I think you'll have to, to explain that a little bit more, how social democrats are social fascists. I, I would like to know that. Um, perhaps you mean that they're still trying to maintain hierarchy, uh, and that has a lot in common with, with fascism. They, they believe in uh, meritocracy, and that has a lot of fascist tendencies as well. So I, I suppose I could see it from that point of view, um, cause yeah, meritocracy is, is, uh, more or less a mirage. If it did exist, which it probably doesn't, you know, more or less when, when we see a meritocracy playing out, it's people that have the, the best, um, situations ahead of time that, that end up in the best positions at the end of the, the day. Uh, so you say to simplify social Democrats still support capitalism. Yeah. Okay. I wouldn't say that anyone that supports capitalism is necessarily a fascist, and I don't think that's a good way of framing things if we want to recruit any of these people, too, because of all of the people that are most likely to come over to any sort of leftist movement, it's going to be people like the Social Democrats. And if your opening line is, hey, you guys support fascism, then that's just going to cause them to react and, and try and defend themselves and... Uh, I don't think it's a good recruiting tactic. So um, fascism is the end stage of capitalism. I, I, I don't think that's an unfair way to, to characterize it. Um, I, I think there has to be a little bit more to make it. I think there is a distinction between just liking capitalism and being a fascist. Um, I think you can want to have a more egalitarian society. 
you can want to do away with things like racism and, and uh, uh, xenophobia and that sort of thing um, and still cling to capitalism, um, probably mistakenly. I would say definitely mistakenly, actually. But I don't think that necessarily makes you a fascist. I think fast to be an actual fascist, you have to you have to believe in in it's like the the opposite end of capitalism, really. So you could say it's the end stage, but it's it's the you know the the intertwining of uh, business and and uh, government um, for the the upliftment of a very select specialized or special class. Uh, it's it's the scapegoating of of one minority or another, usually one that has much less power, in order to uplift that that special minority that you're looking for. It's uh, the imagining of a perfect past when when the the correct the quote unquote correct hierarchy was in place. Um, Oh, thank you so much for the follow. I really appreciate that. And I really appreciate your, your questions, too. You, you're giving me a lot to think about as well. So I, I can see how you would, you would characterize fascism as just the, the opposite, the rightmost end of the capitalist spectrum. Because, um, yeah, it definitely is, is not necessarily opposed to capitalism. It just wants it for a specific class of people. Um, but fascism is, is, is very hard to define, and that's, that's one of the very difficult things and dangerous things about it is because it will, to me, more than anything at the core of, of fascism is the pursuit of absolute power. It's uh, the idea that, that me, and if it has to be people like me, uh, deserve to be in all the, the most favored positions in society, and anyone that gets in our way we should either violently repress or outright murder or or uh, do away with. To me, that that's more what what fascism is. So at any point, it can just kind of superficially adopt any dogma. I mean, I'm sure you're aware of of the Strasserites in in um, the the Nazi Party who superficially adopted things like socialism as as an idea. Of course, they meant it only for the the Aryan people. Uh, and not for anyone else. And in practice, they ended up just slaughtering that entire wing of the party. Uh, so when, when, you know, yeah, yeah, the, 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 the so-called left Nazis, like when they no longer became uh, an important instrument to accumulate more power, they were just dispensed with. And I think that's what you'll see with, with any sort of wing of Nazism is the, the, the most powerful part of it is always going to cannibalize the, the weakest part if it no longer finds it necessary. So fascism is always moving towards that center of power. And to me, more than anything, that's what characterizes it. And it, and it will superficially adopt any position, even contradictory positions. In fact, sometimes especially contradictory positions. Uh, the, the idea being that if you, if you proclaim these contradictory positions... Um, earnestly, then you are proving above everything else that you are loyal to the, the, the fascists, right? You're, going, you're willing to go so far that you will believe literally contradictory things. So it's, it's a test of loyalty. So they, they very much like loyalty because it's a, a, a way that they get power. And they will turn, but they will turn, they will, you know, um, discard any sort of ideology as soon as it, it suits their purposes to accumulate more power. Right. Just like they they uh, destroyed the, the Warsaw Pact with the, the Soviets as soon as it became, you know, beneficial to their ideas to um, to uh, to not have that anymore. And they, they just turned on the USSR. So they will always be your friend until they, they stab you in the back. Right. And then and it's just an exercise in, in <laughs> well, basically genocide and then eventually suicide because eventually everyone dies under fascism because there's no absolute purity that, that anyone can reach. And as soon as you, even if you were able to eliminate the, the you know, some so, uh, one so-called group of impure, you're just going to turn to another one, another division. It's always about division, using that division to sow discord amongst your, your enemies and accumulate more power for yourself. So yeah, so M Mussolini was formerly a socialist. But you're right, when it became, uh, you know, 
advantageous for him to adopt more right-leaning rhetoric and, and tactics, he cast aside socialism without a thought. So, so that more than anything to me is the, what, what is at the core of fascism, that pursuit of, of absolute power and the, the backstabbing of, of any other rival component of that power, even if you've used them as allies in the past in order to further your own power ideas and uh, agendas. But let's continue on in the text here. Uh, okay, according to Marx, the state is an organ of class rule, an organ for the opposition of one class by another. It is the creation of order, which legalizes and perpetuates this oppression by moderating the conflict between the classes. In the opinion of the petty bourgeoisie politicians, however, order means the reconciliation of classes and not the oppression of one class by another. Yeah. So, again, the, um, the petty bourgeoisie being those that, that are small-time business owners that don't have the, the power of the, you know, the outright bourgeoisie, they will, always, they will always cheerlead for the system because they believe that it's going to move them higher and higher because they already have a little bit of power. They just, they, they, they envy and want to be the bourgeoisie themselves. So they, they will spin these lies that, that uh, government is there just to, to moderate things and to, to make things um, okay for everybody, just kind of even things out rather than uh, to stand in the way of, of these uh, class antagonisms and, and get rid of them altogether. Okay, so, and not the oppression of the class, of one class by another. To alleviate the conflict means reconciling <clears throat> classes and not depriving the oppressed classes of uh, definite means and the methods of struggle to overthrow the oppressors. For instance, when, in the revolution of 1917, the question of significance and the role of the state arose in all its uh, magnitude as a practical question demanding immediate action and, moreover, action on a mass scale, all these social revolutionaries and Mensheviks descended at once to the petty bourgeoisie theory that the state reconciles classes. Innumerable rec resolutions and articles by politicians of both these parties are thoroughly saturated with this petty bourgeoisie and Philistine uh, reconciliation and reconciliation in quotes theory. The state is an organ of rule of a definite class which cannot be reconciled with its uh, antipode, the class opposite to it. It is something the petty bourgeoisie Democrats will never be able to understand. Their attitude to the state is one of the most striking manifestations of the fact that our socialist revolutionaries and Mensheviks are not socialists at all, a point that we Bolsheviks have always maintained. But petty bourgeoisie Democrats using their near socialist phraseology. So he's basically saying that they're using the language of, of socialism to amass their own power, to, to further amass their own power, and that they're not to be trusted, that when it comes down to it, basically what they want is, is for themselves to be in a good position, and they don't necessarily care about the masses of people that, that may not be. On the other hand, the Kotskyite distortion of Marxism is far more subtle. Theoretically, it is not denied that this state I, that the state is an organ of class rule, that class antagonisms are irreconcilable. But what is overlooked or glossed over is this. If the state is a product of the irreconcilability of class antagonisms, if the power standing above society and alienating itself more and more from it, it is clear that, that the liberation of the oppressed classes is impossible, not only without a violent revolution, but also without the destruction of the apparatus of state power, which was uh, created by the ruling class and which is the embodiment. So Lenin is saying that basically for, lib for true liberation to happen, it can only happen violently because the, the ruling classes will, will never oblige uh, a peaceful revolution. And that also you have to eventually uh, destroy the apparatus of, of power which keeps the current system in place. 
right? And then assumingly, I'm, I'm assuming we're getting to the point where then the people take over as, as the, the new government. So government of the people rather than a separate class of people that, that just maintains the status quo. As we shall see later, Marx very explicitly drew this theoretically self-evident conclusion on the strength of a concrete historical analysis of the tasks of the revolution. And as we shall show in the detail further on, it is the conclusion which Kautsky has forgotten and distorted. Special bodies of armed men, prisons, and etc. Engels continues, as distinct from the old tribal or clan order, the state first divides its subjects according to territory. This division seems natural to us, but it costs a prolonged struggle against the old organization according to generations or tribes. Okay? So I think what he's saying is that, you know, it seems like boundaries are, are naturally drawn, but perhaps he's, he's alluding to, like, uh, what the Europeans did when they carved up Africa. They, they just kind of haphazardly drew things to put people that have historically had friction with one another together and in, in ways where one of them gains just a numerical and then power uh, majority. Um, so I think that's perhaps what he's looking at or how he's looking at things. Um, the second distinguishing uh, feature is the establishment of the public power, which no longer directly coincides with the population organizing itself as an armed force. This special public power is necessary because a self acting armed organization of the population has become impossible uh, since the split into classes this public power exists in every state it consists not merely of armed men but also of material adjuncts prisons and institutions of coercion of all kinds of which tribal or clan society knew nothing so we're, we're imposing modern uh, prejudices onto the people just by uh, putting in these these apparatuses that that are um, adjacent to um, state power, things like prisons in, and, and other institutions of coercion. Engels elucidates the concept of the power, which is called the state, a power which arose from society, but places itself above it and alienates itself more and more from it. Okay. So that, that, that's the idea of not a government of the people, but just the separate class of, of rulers. Um, oh, was, was that a, a link that you, you sent there, Bread Crochets? Because uh, I do have that. No, that's, that's totally fine. Um, if you want to whisper it, me the link, or if you want to just spell it out without the dot com, I can look it up too. Whisper it to me? Sure, that'll work. Anyway, let, let's, let's back up a second. Engels elucidates the concept of power, which is called the state, a power which arose from society but places itself above it and alienates itself more and more from it. What does this power mainly consist of? It consists of special bodies of armed men having prisons, etc. at their command. So basically, the apparatus of, of coercion is uh, what that looks like and that that's used to maintain this, this separate state. We are justified in speaking of special bodies of armed men because the public power, which is an attribute of every state, does not directly coincide with the armed population, with its self-acting armed organization. Like all great revolutionary thinkers, Engels tries to draw the attention of class-conscious workers to what prevailing philistinism regarded as least worthy of attention as the most habitual thing hallowed by prejudices that are not only deep-rooted but one might say petrified a standing army and police are the chief instruments of state power and that that has definitely been made evident over the course of of the pandemic um especially yeah it, it's pretty clear what what side of of things uh the military stands on what side of things police stand on and these are the, the, uh, the instruments of, of government power, a government that is separate from the people. But how can it be otherwise? From the viewpoint of the vast majority of Europeans of the end of the 19th century, whom Engels was addressing, and who had not gone through or closely observed a single great revolution, it could not have been otherwise. 
they could not understand at all what a self-acting armed organization of the population was. When asked why it became necessary to have special bodies of armed men placed above society and alienating them themselves from it, police and the standing army, the West European and Russian Philistines are inclined to utter a few phrases borrowed from Spencer or Mikhailovsky to refer to the growing complexity of social life, the differentiation of functions, and so on. Such a reference seems scientific and effectively lulls the ordinary person to sleep by obscuring the important and basic fact, namely the split of society into irreconcilable antagonistic classes. Were it not for this split, uh, the self-acting armed organization of a population would differ from the primitive organization of a stick-wielding herd of monkeys or of primitive men or of men united in clans by its complexity its high technical level, and so on. But such an organization would still be possible. So basically he's saying that that, uh, that in this sort of a configuration, the, the separate class of, of warriors and, and police, they're, they're no different than, than uh, I guess, the most savage of people is what he's trying to allude to. The only difference is their, their technical complexity. It is impossible because civilized society is split into antagonistic and moreover irreconcilably antagonistic classes whose self-arming would lead to an armed struggle between them. A state arises, a special power is created, special bodies of armed men and every revolution, by destroying the state apparatus, shows the naked class struggle, clearly shows us how the ruling class strives to restore the special bodies of armed men which serve it, and how the oppressed class survives to create a new organization of this kind, capable of serving the exploited instead of the exploited. In the above argument, Engels raises theoretically the very same question which every great revolution raises before us in practice. Palpably and, what is more, on the scale of mass action, namely, the question of the relationship between special bodies of armed men and the, quote, self-acting armed organizations of the population. So this would be just the, the difference between a, a special class of, of military and, and police and people just of their own accord organizing themselves into militias and uh, public safety forces, you know, for their own ends rather than the ends of the, this separated state. We shall see how this question is specifically illustrated by the experience of the European and Russian revolutions. But to return to Engel's exposition, he points out that sometimes in certain parts of North America, for example, this public power is weak. He has in his mind a rare exception in capitalist society, and those parts of North America in the pre-imperialist days where the free colonists predominated. But that, generally speaking, it grows stronger. It, the public power, grows stronger, however, in proportion as class antagonisms within the state become more acute and as, as adjacent states become larger and more populous. Okay, so, so these, these, uh, these executive arms, these uh, executive arms of government, these special classes, grow as antagonisms between the classes widen. We definitely see that <laughs> recently, don't we? And as, uh, as the populations of, of neighboring countries grow. That's no longer necessarily the case um, because, well, I don't really know why, but I, I would assume it's something to do with like uh, imperialism that for better or worse, um, most of the, the so-called Western countries can rely on the military might of the U.S. To, to further their imperialist goals. They don't have to themselves raise a huge army because the U.S. is, is their ally in, in capitalist imperialism, um, and they can do it for them. So you won't see a huge army in, in France or, or the U.K. even. Um, just because they don't really need it anymore, because that's what the U.S. does for them. Well, that's a big thing they do for them. Um, so it's not always in, in comparison to uh, adjacent populations, but 
that's not super important, I don't think. We have only to look at our present-day Europe, where class struggle and rivalry in conquest have turned up the public power to such a pitch that it threatens to swallow the whole of society and even the state. This is uh, this was written not later than the early 90s of the last century, so that'd be the 1890s. Engel's last preface being dated June 16th, 1891. The turn towards imperialism, meaning the, the complete domination of the of the trusts, the omnipotence of the big banks, a grand-scale colonial policy, and so forth, was only just beginning in France and was even weaker in North America and Germany. Since the rivalry in conquest has taken a gigantic stride, all the more because by the beginning of the second decade of the 20th century, the world had be, been completely divided up among these rivals in conquest, i.e. among the predatory great powers. Since then, military and naval armaments have grown fantastically, and the predatory war of 1914-17 to 17 for the domination of the world by Britain and, or Germany for the division of the spoils has brought the swallowing of all the forces of society by the rapacious state power close to complete catastrophe. Engels could, as early as 1891, point to the rivalry in conquest as one of the most important distinguishing features of the foreign policy of the great powers. Well, the social chauvinist scoundrels have ever since 1914, with this rivalry, many times, uh, many times intensified, gave rise to an imperialist war uh, between covering up the defense of predatory interests of their own bourgeoisie with phrases about defense of the fatherland defense of the republic and the revolution uh, there's plenty of parallels in the modern day for for that sort of rhetoric isn't there pretty much any time you see especially like the u.s uh, or, or great britain ramp up to to war it's always in the name of defense isn't it that's that's kind of odd considering the people that we're fighting are usually very far around the world from from any part of our actual territories uh, but that's always used as a cover so, so nothing's really changed in, in that respect since. I'm, I'm just going to stop for the night on that part here. So, the, so next time we'll be talking about the state, an instrument for the exploitation of the oppressed classes. So we're going to get more into that concept. How the modern state, especially under capitalism, is, is a tool of the uh, oppressor classes to continue to oppress both at home and abroad. And I think that's very much a that's very much the truth. Yeah, you you look at the way that we use wars and conflict around the world. It it's it's not just a coincidence that the most powerful corporations, the, the Halliburtons, the Lockheed Martins, um, even the oil companies, uh, they they tend to be the ones who profit most, no matter what the outcome is. People talking about how uh, Afghanistan was was such a failure. That, that we had to pull out of it. But from the point of view of uh, a lot of uh, weapons contractors and, and energy companies, it was n nothing but a success. It was a complete success because they don't care about the well-being of Afghani people. They don't care about long-term stability even. In a certain sense, instability is good for them because they can have then cover to, to have the U.S. government come in and allow them to do whatever the hell they want, uh, regardless of law, right? Because, uh, I mean, there's no such thing as a legal invasion from the point of view of the people that are being invaded. Um, and that allows them to do, to do a lot of stuff that makes them a lot of money uh, at the direct expense of the people that are already there and already the people that have most likely already have been uh, the most oppressed by, by the... the former ruler um, party or, or group of people. Um, and then at home, you see the, the people that are given the most harsh treatment when it comes to even simply protesting. Uh, it's always people that are talking against the, the current system, not, not saying we need to go back, we need to, uh, uh, you know, reinforce the, the old ways because the old ways were good. Those people are always treated with kid gloves 
by the police to the point where they can even get inside the the uh, federal capitol building, sometimes with the, with the assistance of, of the police. There, there are many instances from the uh, January 6th uprising where uh, the police have been were filmed just literally letting them in, not, not giving them any uh, resistance. Um, so Brad Crochet says, I'm not usually a conspiracy guy, but I get the feeling that ISIS K is just a means to manufacture consent for the Taliban are good guys now. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think there's probably a lot of truth in that. And I mean, if, if anything, it's going to be more basis for the U S to just have a prolonged, uh, presence in Afghanistan, of course, for, for the benefit of the Afghani people, not, not for the benefit of, of the companies, U S companies that, that, profit so much from that of course it'll all be for you know righteous reasons uh, wink wink so yeah I, I i like this book so far um i can see why i can already see why it is uh so influential and and uh uh energizing to to people that 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 really get into uh communist ideology and theory. Um, so yeah, I'm glad I, I'm glad I finally got to it. Um, and chapters aren't exactly numbered. I think we just finished chapter two. I don't know why the chapters are not numbered at all. That's very strange. Unless the chapters are, perhaps I'm not even through the entire chapter. I'm not quite sure how these chapters are organized. If if there's these subsections of those the chapters, or if they the uh, the big boulder text is, I'll have to to figure that out. But I, yeah, I just don't think I can go any any further tonight. My my voice is not not gonna hold up. Um, but this was a fun experiment for sure. Trying to do this, reading the text out loud. It would also help too if I had a a, a, a guest. They could help share some of that burden too. Uh, Two trillion more dollars wasted in Afghanistan. Let's go. Yeah, and that's the thing. They talk about the the however many trillions. Uh, I don't remember exactly what it was. Two trillion, six trillion, whatever it, they had said that we have spent on Afghanistan. They they act as though oh that's all just a waste. Well, that two trillion or that however many trillions of dollars went to somebody, and I'll I'll bet you that the the lion's share of it went to U.S. companies. So from their perspective, again, it's, you know, imperialism and war is, is nothing but a, a profit-making venture. So, yeah, waste. I, I definitely will overall agree that it is a waste, but not for the reasons that they're saying. It's not a waste because we didn't complete the mission that we were supposedly there for. It's a waste because it all went to uh, the most horrible country, or companies, uh, you know, international companies that are destroying the world in, in every sense. You know, weapons contractors, uh, fossil fuel manufacturers, the people that are, are, you know, digging the grave for the rest of the world, so to speak. So, so for those reasons, it definitely was a waste. Okay, I think, I, I think I'm just going to end it for tonight. Um, I do thank you all for, for coming on this journey with me. And I'm going to do something... A little different this time. Uh, so you think you think it's like 1.3 to the industrial complex, 500 billion loans and interest? Yeah, for sure. Lenin is dead, and his legacy, the USSR, is a failed state in the dustbin of history. Someday, so will the USA. Uh, countries always fall. That, that that's inevitable. No no country lasts forever. Um, that doesn't mean that the ideals that Lenin strove for were bad or wrong uh, and that doesn't mean that the USA just because it still continues to chug along is is right either it just happens to be how it went uh, so you are a troll okay well whatever yeah um, I'm definitely an anarchity as well bread crochets I, I definitely skew towards the anarchist side but uh, I'm always interested in 
having more perspectives on the, the readings. Um, it's a big reason why I switch back and forth between anarchist and communist texts. Uh, the USSR and Eastern Europe beg to differ. They hate Lenin. That's cool. They can hate Lenin too. What I hate is tyranny in the workplace. What I hate is a hierarchy that reinforces itself and does not justify itself. What I love is more democracy, more freedom, and more self-actualization for all people. So it doesn't really matter if it's failed a uh, hundred times to, to come to that point. Uh, communism and anarchy are not opposites. They both strive for the same goals. They want to have a classless, moneyless, stateless society. That's, that's what they're both striving for. So no, I, I would not say that they're opposites at all. They're, they are different in the way that they want, they think that we should achieve that. Um, okay, Stalin doesn't speak for all of communism, for one thing, so it doesn't really matter what any single figure uh, says about or, or acts um, as, uh, you know, he doesn't represent all of communism, so... What commie state ever came close to anarchy? I don't, I don't know. I, the, the point is they're both going for the same goals. They want more egalitarian uh, society. The U.S. says, uh, and Brad Crochet says, the USSR was war communism due to, you know, the fucking U.S. constantly trying to destroy them. Absolutely true. And a big reason that, they, that these leftist movements keep failing around the world is because every time one crops up, the, the, these, these so-called Western powers, uh, chiefly the USA and, and the UK, will throw all the resources they possibly can at destabilizing and destroying them. They will install puppet dictators. They will falsify elections. They will just sow discontent and... Uh, you know, uh, misinformation, they will enact embargoes, they will do whatever they can to destroy them. So, yeah, just more excuses for the failure of communism. Well, okay, cool, but also you could look at it this way. If, if capitalism is so inevitable, and it's, it's clearly the best and, 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 and highest form of, of economic and political organization that we could ever achieve, then why does it need to go so far out of its way to destroy anything different in other countries, any sort of leftist movement? Why does it have to put so much resources towards that if it's so inevitable? If, if all of these, these socialists, communists, anarchists experiments are so destined to fail, how come every time the U.S. has to push it and the U.K. has to push it towards failure as, as much as it possibly can? Why would it have to... to, to you know, why would have to do anything if it's inevitable for these these left wing movements to eventually just fail on their own? Why would the U.S. have to do anything? That's some food for thought. How about that? So uh, some some questions for you, Cottonmouth sixty three. Do you think that uh, the the current organization of the workplace is good and just and and the highest that we can we can ever achieve? The the idea that we have a top down structure where an owner can do whatever they want, organize their business however they want at the expense of worker freedom, participation, um, and uh, any sort of democracy. Do you think that is the best that we can ever do? To have uh, basically an authoritarian top-down workplace. So the evils of capitalism are just as an excuse. Sure, bud. Uh, what do we have to brainwash our citizens to love capitalism? Another good question. Yeah, right. Um, we're, we're all about free speech and stuff like that in the marketplace of ideas. Well, how can we have to constantly put our thumb on the scale and teach how great America was and, and gloss over um, its most egregious atrocities? Why can't we just state things as they are? Um, why, do we, why can we never even question the capitalist system, even among supposedly leftist organizations like, like, you know, NPR. NPR never questions capitalism. It might point at some of the 
the, the faults of capitalism, income inequality, uh, homelessness, disempowerment, uh, voter suppression, all these sorts of things. But it will never say this is because of capitalism. It'll just say this is a problem and here's how we, fall, here's how we solve it. And that's, that's supposedly a, a, a leftist institution in this country. But they can't even question the capitalist framework itself. How do you deal with mice at the Kremlin? Answer, put up a sign saying collective farm, then half the mice will starve and the rest. Yeah, that's, that's so hilarious. Uh, the idea that, that somehow if we redistribute things, then everyone will be poor doesn't make mathematical sense. There's an average income in the United States and it's, it's higher than the median income. It's something like $80,000 a year is the average. That means if we, if we total up all the people and all the income that, that's made within the United States comes out to about 80000 a year. That literally means that if we redistributed all income, everyone would get $80,000 a year. And how, would that make everyone poor? I don't see how. I don't see how. That would definitely lift up a whole lot of people that are making you know, next to nothing, not even enough to live on, on a single job. Yep. And you can, you can pull out all sorts of, of people that are, are discontent with communist systems. You're never going to have a system that 100% of people are, are happy with and 100% of people uh, do better in. Of course, the, the people that are, are the, the, in the bourgeois and, and petty bourgeois classes are going to do worse under a system that is more redistributive. Um, and more egalitarian and gives more rights to the workers. Of course, you know, work uh, uh, owners are going to do worse when the workers do better. Of course, that's the case. They will have less freedom uh, relative to what they have now. But if you want the most freedom for the most people, you have to be advocating for the most people, which is the working class, right? You're basically just spamming jokes at this point, cotton mouth. If you're not here to discuss anything, then... Uh, I don't really know what to tell you, but uh, yeah, you don't know anyone who makes 40K bread crochets. Yeah, uh, until just a few years ago, I was in that same boat. Um, luckily, I've, I've found a job now where I'm doing a little bit better, but you know, I'm still not doing, uh, I, I couldn't be considered even probably middle class. So I can only, I, I can't really even imagine how people that are making, you know, three times less than me are, are doing how they're even getting them along. I mean, they basically have to throw their entire lives away to to work enough to to scrape by through several jobs they stitch together. I don't think that's a great world to live in. I don't think that's a, a, a worthy goal to have. Like this this fetishization of, of work as though that somehow makes you a good person um, or provides for future freedom. I, I, uh, I think we can do better. For sure. Why do these jokes come about? Uh, why does any propaganda come about? I, you can't even prove that, that any of these jokes are from actual people that lived under a, a certain regime. And even if you could, it's a, it's a vast minority of, of the people. Uh, so, and again, it doesn't even matter. Like, even if, if a, a country tries for a socialist system, or even a communist system, or an anarchist system, and it fails, it doesn't mean that those underlying ideals were bad or wrong. Like, you're not, you're not arguing from a point of this is better for people. You're just saying, well, here's a bunch of, or not even a bunch of, a handful of, of experiences that, that show that it was bad. That doesn't really prove anything. Uh, and, it, and really, what all you're saying is, is what we have is the best we can hope for. And... Uh, I don't, I don't really see how this is the best we can hope for. This, this can't possibly be the best of all possible worlds. I, I refuse to believe that where, oh, wow. Stop speaking. Uh, what is going on? Siparuski. Thank you for the, the, the most recent follow there. Um, what was the name there? Uh, Siparuski. So thank you for the follow. Appreciate it. So anyway, a guy who's been telling all those those wonderful anecdotes about how horrible communism is, it doesn't really matter because you're not arguing from a place why communism 
or capitalism is good. If you can't even say why ca capitalism is good, then it doesn't matter how many times you show examples of, of failed socialist or communist or anarchist states. Because uh, you can't say that what we have here is, is any better. There's, there's millions of people that live under this current system or are affected through the imperialist uh, um, projection into the world of the capitalist system and uh, have miserable lives because of it. So, I mean, you can collect all of their stories. Uh, in fact, at, at, at some point, I, I do want to do a, a series on empathy. Oh, oh, Saparsky, that was the, the most recent one. So, SIP does that everywhere. Um, yeah, I don't really care about people spamming emojis. That's, that's not a big deal. Capitalism beats communism hands down in wealth production. For who? For who? Uh, mostly for the people that are, are, uh, that are owners, right? Communism, China produced little once they introduced market principles. Well, we all know what happened. Okay. Also, Russia, the USSR and, and China, before that, that change happened, lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty as well. And that it doesn't burn me up <laughs> to say that for you to say that capitalism kicks communism's ass. You can say that all you like. You're not really proving anything. So capitalism is, is good at producing wealth for a few. That's true. And it's it can maintain a very, not even really a minimal existence because because uh, the poorest working class are falling further and further behind and not really even making ends meet at this point on their salaries or their, their wages. So you can't really even provide for them uh, any semblance of a good life, that's for sure, uh, but, but not even a subsistence life, really. So I don't see how that's, that's the best we can do. Capitalism produces wealth. Communism creates poverty. Um, no. <laughs> and in fact, capitalism produces poverty and misery and death all over the place. There's a reason that uh, many of the factories that, that U.S. companies use in, in uh, parts of Asia have nets outside of them. It's because they have taken advantage of, of such uh, underdeveloped working conditions that, that people are so miserable they want to end it all. Uh, that, that's caused by, directly by capitalism. They, they cause all kinds of foreign wars uh, to exploit and, and basically rob less powerful countries. Uh, I'm not going to say less wealthy because they, they have, they're wealthy in resources. They're just not wealthy in being able to uh, take advantage of their own resources. They just don't have the power to do it. But the U.S. comes in and they, they take advantage of them and, you know, either outright rob them or... Uh, exploit them to such an extent that there's not much of a difference. Um, capitalism is built on on all kinds of third world nations doing really backbreaking and 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 you know uh, the kind of work that that damages you, um, grinds you down. Uh, that's that's all what's generating capitalism's wealth. And then the exploitation of the workers in this country as well. Just because you're an owner, you can choose how. Profit is distributed. doesn't matter what anyone says. You are the, the king of the, the company, for better or worse, as the owner. Uh, I'm not going to read your, your any more USSR anecdotes or jokes. I just I don't find that funny or compelling. And uh, capitalism employs theft whenever it can. So again, do you not like democracy? Do you not like freedom? Do you not like self-actualization? Because you pretty much have to be against those things to like capitalism is the best system. Capitalism does not promote democracy or, or freedom or self-actualization, except for the, the very few uh, lucky ones. But your average worker has none of that in, in their day-to-day -day lives. The place that we spend most of our, our work day, or most of our waking hours, I should say, the workplace is not at all a democratic system or a free system or one where a worker has really any say in the runnings, in the compensation, in, in much of anything. Maybe if they have a union, but that, that's in spite of capitalist interests. That's not because of it. Capitalism would do away with all unions if it could because they get in the way of profit for the owners. And that's really all capitalism is about, generating profit for the owners. And it's just 
that they have to accept the reality that their workers can't just drop dead of starvation or homelessness or, or whatnot. They have to maintain them to a very minimal level that they don't take all of the profit. I mean, that, that's the only reason because of that reality. Again, I don't think that's the best we can do. I think we can have more democracy in the workplace. I think workers uh, getting rid of the, the exploiter and exploited relationship and having workers be owners as well equal share owners in, in whatever place you, you work. I like to bring up Denny's a lot. I don't know why it always just comes to mind as like the quintessential uh, capitalist um, food service uh, sort of operation, but, but it does. Let's say you, you work at a Denny's. Instead of Mr. Denny being able to determine your wages, uh, your health care, your working conditions, all of these sorts of things, instead, why not have any every worker have an equal say in all of that stuff. That, that's, that's promoting democracy. Uh, that's promoting freedom and self-actualization. That, that's, that's a level of freedom that perhaps you've never even had yourself. I know I've never had it. I've only ever been a worker. I've, I, I mean, I've had my own landscaping business, but, you know, that was a pretty, pretty small and overall not as consequential part of, of my working life. Um, yeah, I, I, my current job right now, I have zero say in how much I earn. I can ask for more, but I'm still always at the mercy of the owners. I can ask for different workplace safety, but unless there's a law related to it, uh, I'm not going to get those conditions. I'm not going to get that, that PPE that I might need to, to spray, uh, herbicide, jeez. Uh, to spray herbicide, I might not get proper PPE unless there's a law for it. Uh, I'm, you know, I may not get, I wouldn't get any sort of uh, earplugs if there were not OSHA standards for it. So that's that's not really a. I don't really have a place of of much self actualization. I'm, I'm definitely not a democratic member of my my uh, job. The most I can hope for is clout, really getting in good with, with the right people that can I can then influence to pull those levers. But when it comes down to it, you know, if, if, if uh, we fall upon hard times, there's nothing that, that I could do to stop myself from, from being first on the job cuts list, you know? And, and that's the case that, that's the position that most people are in. It, and it has to be that way. We couldn't have an entire nation of entrepreneurs that, that only work for themselves. It just would not function, right? You wouldn't be able to do anything more than than a small mom and pop business. Uh, any any sort of large industrial pursuit, or or you know, we could take even Silicon Valley uh, doing coding. You you know, you could do a very small operation coding just for yourself. But anytime you get more work that than than one person can do, you basically have to form a company. And if it's a capitalist company, that means that someone's going to end up being the owner and a whole bunch more people are going to end up being the workers with, with no rights and, and no ability to really change their situation other than just ask for it. I mean, if they, if they got really serious about it, they could collectively organize. Uh, but again, that, that's, always, that's always concessions that are won in spite of capitalist interests, not never because of it. Um, so you say Brett Crochet's, oh, dang, some rando posted a bunch of USSR jokes. And guess what? I'm totally, totally OK. Suddenly totally OK with stepping on the neck of poor people as long as there is a silver, a sliver of a chance that I might be rich someday. Yeah. <laughs> if you're a farm worker, your boss might sue a safety inspector for trespassing because of course he did. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, capitalism is the pursuit of profit for the owners. And, and, and that last part for the owners should always be included when we're talking about it. Because uh, they just, it's usually just thought of as profit above everything, but it's important to realize where that profit goes and, and how it is allocated. It's all at the discretion of the owners. Unless you're in a worker owned cooperative, in which case you've moved beyond capitalism, in my estimation, you at least have the rudiments of a, a socialist organization. It may still participate in a capitalist market. But the organization of the, the, the business venture itself is still 
socialist if everyone has a democratic say. Um, so yeah, thanks thanks for uh, all the jumping off points there, Mr. Uh, USSR jokes. Definitely a good opportunity to, to bring out that, that stuff at the end there.